A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, for Jew first and then Greek. For in it is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous by faith will live. The wrath of God is indeed being revealed from heaven against every impiety and wickedness of those who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For what can be known about God is evident to them because God made it evident to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood and perceived in what he has made. As a result, they have no excuse. For although they knew God, they did not accord him glory as God or give him thanks. Instead, they became vain in their reasoning, and their senseless minds were darkened. While claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the likeness of an image of mortal man, or of birds, or of four-legged animals, or of snakes. Therefore, God handed them over to impurity through the lusts of their hearts for the mutual degradation of their bodies. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and revered and worshiped the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day pours out the word to day, and night to night imparts knowledge. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. Not a word or discourse whose voice is not heard. Through all the earth their voice resounds, and to the ends of the world their message. Dominus Fobisco. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Luca. After Jesus had spoken, a Pharisee invited him to dine at his home. He entered and reclined at table to eat. The Pharisee was amazed to see that he did not observe the prescribed washing before the meal. The Lord said to him, O oh, you Pharisees, although you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, inside you are filled with plunder and evil. You fools, did not the maker of the outside also make the inside? But as to what is within, give alms, and behold, everything will be clean for you. Febum Domini. (laughs) 
The Franciscan family celebrates today the memorial of Saint Seraphin of Monte Granaro, an Italian saint who lived during the 16th century. Now, when we think of the most popular saints in the church, such as St. Francis of Assisi or Teresa of Avila, D Dominic, Ignatius of Loyola, we usually remember their significant contributions to the church, such as founding religious orders or exercising exceptional skills in preaching or in some other area of expertise. However, the saint whom we celebrate today was exceptional in the sense that he was rather unexceptional. In fact, those who knew Seraphim best described him in this way. His beard and hair were always ruffled. His breath smelled dreadful. His habit covered in patches always slipped down a little on his left side, uh, making his hair shirt visible. His neck was always covered with a burning rash or eczema. He never ever wanted to be touched on the shoulders and he had a great love for flowers and children. So on an ordinary natural level, Seraphim was an unremarkable man. He was born into a poor family and was one of four children. His mother was very devout and she instilled in him an intense spirit of prayer. When he was only a teenager, both of his parents died, leaving him in the care of his brother who tried to teach Seraphin to work as a bricklayer. However, Seraphin's clumsiness rendered him incapable of developing the skills necessary for this type of work. And his brother, who had a terrible temper, constantly yelled at Seraphin and beat him severely. Seraphin patiently bore his brother's abuse and viewed it as a means to pursue holiness. Now, of course, this does not excuse at all his brother's behavior, since he had no right to treat Seraphim in this manner. But Seraphim made the most of the situation in which he found himself, and he was likely fortified by his life of prayer. Seraphim attempted to enter the Capuchins at age 16, but was rejected. He applied again two years later and was finally accepted. And his inclination towards clumsiness followed him into the friary, and he struggled to carry out satisfactorily any of the tasks that were assigned to him. Naturally, this led to Seraphim having to suffer humiliations from his fellow friars. And he was reassigned so many times to so many different locations and so many different Capuchin provinces that it's difficult to determine how long he actually spent at each particular location. He remained for the longest stretch of time, 15 years, at his final assignment before his death. Seraphim was a man of deep prayer. He was known to appear to have his attention fixed on God, even while he carried out normal conversations with, with other people. He would more often spend the night in the chapel than he would in his cell. And if any of the brothers happened to see him in the chapel at night, in his humility, he would pretend to be asleep and would even snore loudly in order to be convincing. <laughs> and when one brother rebuked him for sleeping in the chapel, Seraphim responded half jokingly, my little saint, I get more sleep in the chapel than in the refectory. He reportedly told another brother that he would spend most night nights in prayer in the chapel because he would often find himself struck with terrible temptations against chastity while he was in his cell. He had a strong devotion to the Holy Eucharist, the Mass, and the Blessed Virgin Mary. He was known to carry out several penances on a regular basis. He ate very little food and even refrained from drinking water when traveling during the summer. Yet he always practiced the virtue of charity and was attentive to the needs of his brothers, making sure that they had sufficient provisions. If necessary, he would willingly break his fasts and eat something more in order to persuade a sick brother to eat something for the sake of his health. And as was more common among saints at that time, 
he took on additional penances such as wearing a hair shirt regularly and flagellating himself, both of which are not recommended for our time. Seraphim was tremendously grateful for his Capuchin community, despite their occasional harsh treatment of him. Whenever the other brothers were critical or insulting towards him, he would respond with humility and with a sense of humor. One time a guardian called him a hypocrite, a deceiver of the whole world, and a stiff-necked man. And without skipping a beat, Seraphim responded, I may be a hypocrite, but I am not a lazy one because I'm always going about deceiving now this one and now that one. <laughs> Seraphim was also known to have performed numerous miracles and healings. He healed a young girl who had never been able to speak before. He healed the hands of a priest who suffered from a contagious skin disease. He healed a bishop who was once on the verge of death. And the bishop afterwards said to Seraphim, I made a long journey and was hoping to enter paradise. But thanks to you, they shut the door in my face, threw me down the stairs, and so here I am back in this world. <laughs> it doesn't sound like the bishop was all too happy about this healing. <laughs> and when a brother guardian asked Seraphim about the secret of his holiness and miraculous powers, Seraphim replied very honestly and sincerely, saying, when I came to the friary, I was a poor, unskilled laborer, without ability and without aptitude. And this was the cause of so many humiliations and so many reproofs on which the demon acted, causing the temptation to leave the order and withdraw to the desert to enter my heart. I entrusted myself to the Lord, and one night a voice came out of the tabernacle, saying, to serve God, it is necessary to die to oneself and accept adversities, whatever the nature of these may be. I did accept them and offered to recite the rosary for those who inflicted them on me. The familiar voice from the same tabernacle assured me, saying, your prayers for those who mortify you are most pleasing to me. I am ready in exchange to grant you every grace. I think St. Seraphim is a model for anyone who feels that they are inadequate or unremarkable, who tends to be clumsy, who perhaps lacks many skills, or even tends to suffer insults and undue criticism from others. As I said before, there is nothing remarkable about Seraphim on a natural level. He is not particularly gifted in any area except in his life of intense prayer and his incredible patience in enduring insults. In an ideal world, of course, no one should have to suffer from insults or from any sort of abuse, verbal or otherwise. But we know, unfortunately, that we do not live in an ideal world. Hence, Seraphim provides us with a model of how we might suffer patiently if we should find ourselves in a similar situation. He teaches us how we can maintain the virtue of charity and to turn such occasions of humiliation into opportunities to grow in holiness. Seraphim is an example of prayer, patience, humility, gratitude, and undying Christian charity in the face of all sorts of adversity.